Pen Farthing, absolute pleasure, mate, to have you not in a studio but on Zoom. But so be it. This is modern modern life, and yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is. And, and, and you've got far too much going on to be able to make a journey here anyway. So um, thank you for your time. All the same, I do appreciate it. Testing times for you at the moment. Um, what we were talking about, what I'd like to do is, again, and slight, partly for my own ignorance, I'm fully aware of Nowzad, fully aware of you. We've been talking intermittently for the last couple of years via Tony Lewis, trying to get a podcast sorted. And here we are, right? Um, but partly to my own ignorance as well. Can you do me a favour, mate? And for the listeners and the viewers, and can you explain, um, so what Nowzad was doing, does do, um, uh, and where in Afghan and for what reasons. So, and this is before, obviously, the 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 fall of Afghan, the fall of Kabul. Is that all right with you? Yeah, no, no, it's, uh, that's absolutely fine, yeah. Um, and it was what Nowzad does, because we don't do it anymore, sadly. Um, so for the last 15 years, I've run an animal welfare shelter and clinic, small animal clinic, in Kabul, which some people be like, do what? I thought this is like a, you know, for ex-military guys and military guys, etc. Um, so I used to be a Royal Marine Commando. I did 22 years, um, served out in Helmand, and I came across a fighting dog, um, you know, this stray street dog that's been used for dog fights by the Afghan police. Um, his ears are all cut off, his tail was missing, he had all these scars down the side of his face. Um, and I saw them fighting him against another dog, and obviously I wasn't going to let that fly, so... I broke up that dog fight, didn't really think too much about it. And then when I was, because I was a troop sergeant back then, when I was patrolling around our little compound down in the town of Nauzad and Helmand, I found this little stray street dog, um, you know, and he was carrying away. And so kind of, I wanted to get him out. I didn't really trust him. I thought he might bite one of my guys, but as I tried to get him out, me and him kind of fell for each other. And over the coming days, yeah, he'd just come and sit with me. I might be sat there cleaning my weapon, you know, writing orders out, doing whatever I did. And he'd just come and sit with me. And I'd end up like just stroking the top of his head. You know, and we both took comfort from each other, I guess, in that. You know, I could pretend for five minutes I wasn't in Helmand. You know, I just sat with this little dog. Um, and so that's how the Nazad charity started. I realised that actually maybe um, after I'd finished in the Corps that there was, you know, things I could do in Afghanistan to help the Afghan people in the way of animal welfare. Over a thousand Afghans a year die from being bitten by a rabid dog. Um, there aren't any, or there's only a few hospitals that actually carry the rabies vaccine. So, you know, the young child gets bitten, that's it. It's literally game over. They've got 24 hours to be vaccinated. And if your hospital doesn't carry the vaccine, there's nothing you can do. So that's how the Nazad charity started. And as soon as I started this charity, I got calls from other soldiers. I thought I was unique looking after this stray dog when I'd been in Helmand. I wasn't, wasn't at all. Um, and so to date now, the Nazad charity has actually helped over 1,700 soldiers be reunited with a dog or a cat that they adopted whilst they were out in Afghanistan. Um, and we, we kind of expanded. Um, our work took us to all aspects of animal welfare within Kabul and the wider reaches. We employed the first ever female Afghan nationals who are fully qualified veterinarians. So I had these young women, just 22, 25 years old, um, who were there at the front, you know, telling these Afghan men how they should be looking after their donkeys or out in the streets catching dogs and cats to be vaccinated, new to spade, and then put back on the streets. Um, so it, it was thriving. And we, we um, like I said, we're expanding. We just finished. And I, when I see it and think about this now, and I, I don't want to do the uh, choking up thing, on a podcast but we just finished expanding we just built a forty thousand dollar new quarantine and isolation facility and we opened it the day before the taliban arrived in kabul unbelievable it's just exactly. sat there empty now just <laughs> just so gone yeah so now that then was was formed partly out of obviously the welfare of the animals but also partly out of welfare of Afghan nationals, and that's correct, right? Listen, hearing what you said. Yeah, we because we couldn't do, you know, obviously rescuing a dog for a soldier, so a Brit soldier, you know, that helped that dog out and it helped the British soldier out, but it did nothing for the Afghan people, <clears throat> you know. So 
one of the things we wanted to do was actually by rescuing these dogs make a difference for the Afghan people. So that's the charity then employed people. So we have 25 Afghan nationals. Um, yeah, their average wage is about $300, $400 a month at most. Um, but that's then plowing obviously money back into the economy, giving them a job. Um, and so we realized then obviously, well, if we're helping this one soldier's dog because we're vaccinating nutrient it, why don't we then you know, go out on the street and neuter and vaccinate 20 Afghan dogs that aren't going to go anywhere, but we can put them back on the street. They won't have puppies and we know that they won't be spreading the rabies, vaccine, yeah, rabies um, disease. So that's how it worked. So, yeah, we used the, the soldier rescues as the PR for the charity because, you know, sadly, there's too many charities around the world that has to do that kind of work for rabies. So it's a struggle to get obviously recognised and get funding. But for our charity, we had the, you know, the ace in the hole, as they say, and we had obviously the soldier rescues. And so everybody you know, loves a picture of a soldier with a cute little puppy they're looking after. So that was how we drew people into the charity to see what we did. There we go. That is, there's a, my, in my ignorance, I thought it was the, the prime aim, which is down to your good marketing probably, was um, we, you know, getting, getting those, those uh, dogs back to the uk that so you know the, like you said the soldier the the, the 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 happy story thing but that that was part of it but that was just the conduit for the greater good right okay i feel like a right moron now i'm, I'm yeah slightly <laughs> yeah, myself. Just, i mean people you know you know unless unless you're into dog welfare and stuff you know why would you know i mean you know this is you know with tony lewis you know obviously the legend that is tony lewis um yeah, that's how we we connected was obviously because of his son Conrad. Um, he was looking after a dog, you know, out in Helmand Province. We got the phone call from Tony. Um, you know, and I thought it was just another one of the you know rescue calls that I used to get all the time back then. And then you know, he said, Oh, my son's looking after this dog. I was like, Yeah, well, no problem, just give me some details. You know, and that's when Tony said, Well, actually, my son being killed in action just a couple of weeks earlier. Um, you know, and obviously the lump in the throat, and I'm like, uh, you know, what the heck do I say? Apart from, yep, we'll get your dog. Um, and as we had to figure out, obviously, how to you know, to get little Peg out of where she was in Helmand. Thankfully, the Paris were still looking after her. Um, and we were able to you know, support that rescue and get Peg back to the UK. But, you know, Tony soon realised the other work that we were doing. And then through his charity, 353, you know, they support now for like the last five years, um, all the intern programs that we've had at Nelzad. So we've had actually over 100 veterinary students come through the doors at Nelzad. Um, you know, and we've called the clinic back then, we called it the Private Conrad Lewis Small Animal Clinic in honour of his son. Um, and we've had over, like I said, 100 students a um, year come through who actually have been you know, trained through funds that 353 have run. Um, yeah, and they're the ones who are now going out into the communities, doing the vaccinations, um, you know, and doing that small animal work. Uh, to help the Afghan community. So, yeah, it's always been a bigger picture, but it was the soldier's rescue that was the catalyst that started it. Yeah, I, I know that story well. So I, I served with Comrade Lewis, and um, I'm with the other guy, guy who was killed with him as well, Lewis Hendry, and I'm, I'm, I met Peg out there when I, I was on the same tour with him. Obviously, it wasn't called Peg at the time. I know. Peg we, is... we used the real name. <laughs> we used the, uh, the fake name now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's the it's the I can say the PC name. It's the uh, it's the social media friendly name. No, and then um, and so yeah, I like sort of kind of saw firsthand like you did that aspect of it where it's not solely trying to get a dog back. It's the parent of a, a, a you know a lad has been KIA trying to get a piece of yeah a piece of their son back in in a strange kind of way. Their life out there that they didn't know about kind of thing. Um, and then I met peg a couple of years back again reunited myself again at tony's house so yeah i understand it completely where so where in kabul is is the hq situated is it you know in the, in, in the city heart of the city is in the outskirts build that picture oh, so we we've got a, a house in the clinic so that's where i've lived for the last two years which is more or less right in the middle of kabul um uh, you've got the Dalaman road and you've got the king's palace to the south so we're we're just up from that really um and then uh, we've actually got two other facilities so we've got the actual dog shelter proper that had over 140 dogs in clearly we couldn't have that in Kabul because of the noise so that was on the very outskirts 
Um, and we've also got the first ever, well, we did have <laughs> the first ever donkey sanctuary in Afghanistan. So obviously you've got over a million working donkeys. Um, yeah, and these things are just absolutely abused day in, day out. So part of our mission, and again, we just got that going properly this year, um, was going out on the streets and tackling that head on. So, you know, stopping these donkey owners um, with their donkeys, with these horrendous loads and these absolutely just desperate injuries um, that they had from carrying all of this. Um, so we were out there stopping and promoting animal welfare, bringing their donkeys in if they need to be hospitalised, um, you know, and changing the owners' attitudes to to these animals, you know, that are basically their lifeline. Um, so, yeah, we had three three sites going. Um, and like you know, myself and obviously my wife, my wife worked out in Afghanistan as well. She worked for another NGO, an NGO called Ascend Athletics. Um, so we, we lived there more or less solidly for the last two years. Um, you know, when I step out of this quarantine, um, you know, back into England, that'll be the first time I've actually stood on English soil for two years now. Jesus. Can we take a step back a minute? Over the time that you were, you from when you started the charity out there to, I don't want to, I don't want to say the end of the charity. It's like I've got some semblance of the hope there, but to now, <laughs> did you see um, an impact that you guys were having, guys and girls were having, on um, how Afghans that you uh, had influence on the way they they would. Um, treating their animals did you see an improvement in animal welfare in any way shape or form in general even my no, or... yeah 100 percent um well, like i said we had a small animal clinic so yeah and it was a proper you know front of house there's your reception you'd come in you know you'd, your animal would be processed through then it, one of our vets would be called to see the animal would obviously you know, um give any form of treatment or whatever it was that they needed you know, and 75% of our clientele were local Afghans. So, you know, they'd bring their cat in, they'd bring their little dogs in. Um, you know, we had um, working dogs come in. So, like, from Kabul Airport, the working dogs there, they'd be brought to us by their Afghan handlers. Um, so, yeah, we, you know, we saw a massive difference. You know, people forget the uh, religious aspect, you know, thinking, oh, well, people there are Muslims, so they don't like dogs or cats. Yeah, that's completely rubbish. It's just like being in Britain. You know, you walk down the street, you meet 10 people, five of them like dogs, five don't like dogs. Um, and that's the same in Afghanistan. You know, people like dogs, they don't like dogs. It's got absolutely nothing to do with religion. Um, so, yeah, once people realised there was this clinic operating, um, they actually knew what it was doing and didn't overcharge. All of our, like, vaccines were free. So when we gave out, you know, every dog was uh, vaccinated for rabies, that was free. Um, you know, we started to get a lot of clients coming in. Um, you know, and it was amazing to see how these people treated, you know, these animals, you know, just like we would with, you know, our dog or a cat. And we then started getting people who found injured dogs or cats out on the street. They'd either bring the animal to us or they'd ring us up and say, you need to get down to, you know, this street in time, any. Um, you yeah, know, because there's a dog lying on the side of the road. It's just been hit by a car. Um, yeah, and that was just, the, the everyday Afghan people who were making the call. And we used to have, um, again, thinking about it now, it's actually really bloody sad. Uh, we used to have our Afghan Animal Hero Award. So anybody who reported an injured animal to us and we were able to go out and get it, we'd then have a little ceremony back at our clinic a couple of days later where we'd give them a, this nice little certificate, Animal Hero Award, um, from you know, stopping and being the difference and not just walking by as most people would. Um, and now I see it all to you, it's kind of all come back. That's all gone. <laughs> and that, that doesn't exist anymore now. That's just beyond sad. How did, uh, what about the attitude towards the way you were employing women, the way they were integrated into the charity? Do you ever face any issues with that or, or, or see an improvement in attitude towards that at a time? What was that like? Because I imagine we, 10, 10, 15 years ago, it was a, a little bit of a different situation. Yeah, I mean, it was. And, but Kabul, you know, the Kabul's a city of over 5 million people. Um, but it's become so progressive in the right direction. And when we first started, there was a little bit of, you know, the, the girls would sit over one side, the men would be over the other side. But we also had a problem with the men not talking to the men because they're all from different, you know, 
tribal backgrounds as you like, you know, Hazaras or Tajiks or Pashtuns. Um, so we had, a, we had a little bit of that. And then I used to get so fed up with it. And I was just like, right, all of you now, you're employed by Nauzad. He said, so we're all just one family here now working for one cause. So I said, I don't care if they're female, you're Pashtuns, you're Tajiks, whatever it is. I said, we all get on because we're here when you come in. I said, I don't want any of that stuff from outside brought in. Um, and we worked on that. And then if you had seen like lunch times at the clinic, because under Afghan labor law, you have to provide lunch for the staff. So we had a cook who came in and he did the lunch and she used to cook everything in oil. Oh my God. Um, everything in oil. Um, but she'd cook that I and mean, you'd see them all and they were just laughing, talking. It was, you know, boy, girl, boy, no one cared anymore. Everybody sat next to each other. Um, you know, and it was just absolutely fabulous to, to be a part of that and to see it all. And that was where Afghanistan was headed. You know, you go out on the streets in Kabul, um, you know, and there's little coffee shops, um, you know, and um, cafes and stuff like that. And people would be in there, you know, quite often now I'd see couples walking down the road in Kabul holding hands. Oh, yeah, wow. that's that's just, you know, if you think about it in Afghanistan, you know, everybody automatically thinks of a burqa. You know, that wasn't Kabul. You're not going to see women without a headscarf on, but, you know, they were more daring now as in they were wearing, you know, coloured headscarves and maybe they weren't as you know tight around their heads as they used to be. And it, it definitely, you know, definitely heading in the right direction. Um, and again, I, you know, I'll come back to every time I say something like this now just to get the point over, but all of that's gone. In the space of two weeks, we have literally just destroyed that country and we've just put it back to the day that we, you know, we went in there back in 2001 or wherever it was. It's just, if I sit thinking about it, it's just absolutely crazy. It is beyond sad that all of that has gone. You know, our staff never, obviously we've had massive debates, haven't we, in the UK about immigration over the last few years, you know stop immigration and all these people trying to come in and Brexit and everything. But these people like who work for us at Nauzad, you know, my staff, they didn't want to come to England. Yeah. They wanted to visit maybe for a holiday because they all, you know, a couple of them into their football when they want to go and see Arsenal play or Chelsea play. Um, but they didn't want to leave. They, that Afghanistan was their country. Um, and now they've got no choice but to leave, leave along with, you know, so many other people. We've just created this massive, immigration problem that's been going on for years now as people trying to escape this brutal regime in Kabul. It's it's just so sad and desperate. It's unbelievable. At what point did you realize things are going pear shaped out there before did you get to did you hear talks of evacuation? Did you hear did you what was going down? When did you when did you realize that things may not turn out the way you thought they were going to turn out? Obviously, we knew from Trump, so back in January 2020, so we knew, obviously, he'd said the Americans were going to pull out. Um, yeah, naively, I guess. Um, you know, we truly believe when Biden came to power that he was going to be, you know, this, this fresh breath of air that would actually look at the Afghan problem and do something about it. And I know, and a lot of people go, oh, you can't have troops staying on the ground forever. And I know that. I get that. Ne I've never, ever said that. But I think he could have gone back. Oops, sorry. Somebody tried to call me, so I don't know if that no, sorry. blanked me out. Um, so we, you know, we thought Biden might just actually though, go back to the Taliban and say, great, we are going to leave, but we'll leave once you actually go to the negotiation table properly and actually you know, put, some, put some proper... Um, you know, positions on that table that can be kept to, i.e., you know, women's rights, um, you know, obviously how they're going to deal with international trade, how they're going to deal with the aid money, obviously letting NGOs carry on their business, you know, that kind of thing. We actually thought he would do that, but instead he, he just ploughed on. And when he started you know, saying, well, we are going to withdraw on this date, I think that was the, you know, the catalyst for the Afghan army realised that they had no support anymore because obviously... You know, as you know, America stopped um, the air support and then had to hastily start it again when things really started going south. Um, but it was too late by then. You know, the rot had set in. The Afghan army realized that they actually didn't have the backing of you know, America. Um, 
and seeing obviously their commanders, you know, flee. You know, why why would the ordinary soldiers stay if their commanders just obviously run? Um, so we thought we had, again, we were listening to all the intelligence reports. We thought we had at least a month in Kabul. Um, so we had actually made preps and plans to evacuate. You know, all our animals were booked on, you know, cargo flights out of Kabul. Uh, my wife was booked on a flight. You know, she had a ticket with Turkish Airlines. You know, they they flew daily into Kabul. So she was on a flight ready to go. But we thought we had. At what point was this, you know, Ben? Sorry. This was How just what? like um, probably about three weeks ago now. Okay. Yeah, you know, when we thought, okay, you know, Kabul's probably going to fall in about a month's time. So what we'll do is we'll get out, we'll get as many of the animals out as possible, and then we can obviously see, you know, what happens. And we, again, we're all still hoping that, if Biden would realise he'd made this massive mistake and he would actually try and correct it. Um, so my wife was booked on a flight. Um, you know, we've got all the animals booked, all their paperwork's ready to go on cargo flights with Turkish to get them out. Um, and then suddenly, you know, we we see in the reports, well, hang on a minute, you know, Kandahar's just fallen, Harat's just fallen, Mazar's just fallen, oh, Kunduz has just fallen. And we're all like, hang on a minute, this isn't going right. And then we hear that the Taliban were in Logar province, which is right next door to Kabul. Yeah, that's literally half an hour's drive from Kabul. Um, and on that day, that's when we heard that Turkish Airlines suddenly just said, we're not flying anymore. And my wife's flight was the next day. Um, so we knew then that obviously the evacuation hadn't started from the airport. You know, and that we were sat there as the Taliban walked up the street the very next day. How did you, when you were planning for that, you know, that, that uh, staged with, withdrawal from there for, for, for the animals and for you guys, how did you break that, that news of that decision to the staff? What was that? The like? staff, you know, again, they were okay. They said, you should go. You're a, you're a Westerner. If you're here when the Taliban come, then, you know, you're going to be in trouble. And obviously they knew my background. Um, you know, and a lot of them didn't want me to be there for the simple fact that, yeah, obviously being a former all marine and I'd obviously said a lot in the press about you know my time and you know it's well known that obviously down in Helmand we were fighting the Taliban so you know they said you should go and get as many of the dogs and cats out as possible because what we wanted to have was basically a sanitized clinic so that there would be no you know British or American connection um, you know, and especially you no know, dogs there, and then we could see what the lay of the land is. You know, maybe the Taliban have changed, and you know, we'd actually come back then because they were like, "Yeah, this is a cool. You can run a clinic," but we so didn't want to be there to find out. So potentially, the, the clinic could have still operated potentially as an Afghan clinic until such time it was safe for you guys to come back in, if that was a possibility. Exactly. Yeah. So just a sanitized and clinic with no connection and, to the and west. The staff, you know. and the staff were looking to keep it going. Yeah, and the staff, you know, thought this would be, you know, we could we could maybe, you know, keep this going, we'll be able to do this. But um, you yeah, know, the report started coming in of how they were treating people down in the south. Um, you know, some of our staff obviously, you know, they come from all over Afghanistan. They're not just, you know, um from Kabul. So, you know, some of them were coming in that how some of them were going around, sorry, some of the Taliban were going around houses and were asking for lists of all the single women who weren't married. Um, yeah, this is up in a place called uh, Barakshan. Um, For what reason? Yeah, so, that's, uh, so they could be married off, because obviously you've got all these Taliban fighters who are coming from all over, um, yeah, who aren't married. Um, yeah, and so for them marrying off to the, the single women. So these reports started coming back, and that's when we realised, actually, you know, this, this is definitely not heading in the right direction. Um, you know, what can we do for our staff as well now? Because we're in that position. My wife couldn't get out. Um, we knew we, like I said, we were stuck in that very next day. The Taliban walked up the road. Um, you know, and we all sat in the house. We sat in the house with our staff. Um, and, you know, everybody was just terrified. And um, we were just sat in the main office area. Obviously, everybody's on, like, their social media. Um, yeah, and we didn't really need to be because we could look out the window and see them all walking past. So, Where are we getting the hit reports from? The FCO? Um, no, the Foreign Office um, don't give out um, intelligence reports. It comes from another charity. There's, a, there's an organisation called INSO. Um, they're a registered charity in the UK, but they give all the um, intelligence reports to all NGOs who operate in Afghanistan. 
Um, you know, and they're incredibly good. Those, those, that team is absolutely amazing. Um, you know, so you get text messages telling you to look at your email because then there'll be a more detailed report. Um, you know, and so I was signed up to the reports from all over the country. So literally my phone was going off every two minutes with updates from everywhere. And it was, you know, literally, you know, minute by minute, the Taliban are here, Taliban are here, Taliban are here, and they're facing no resistance. They've just taken this district compound, this district compound, or these 500 Afghan soldiers have just surrendered. Um, and it was on mass surrenders like that, you know, just 500 guys handing their weapons in to 50 Taliban. It was absolutely crazy. Um, there was just no fight in them. And that's how they swept the country up in literally, I think, about four days. It was just crazy. When they were coming up the street, when you, when you, when you, you, you were know, that close, what were they doing? What, what they were, what were they doing through the town, the city at that time? Um, thankfully, when they took Kabul, there was a little skirmish on the outskirts in a place called um, Karga Lake, which is about five miles out of Kabul. Some AMP and some pl uh, Afghan army, I think, put up a little bit of resistance, but they then took Kabul without a single shot being fired. Um, so they started to come in the gates and then the Taliban command told them to withdraw to the city limits. So they came in and then went back out again and waited on the outskirts. Um, during that time, the Afghan police in Kabul literally took their uniforms off and ran. Um, so there was no police on the ground. So that night there was a lot of looting you know, and criminality going on and people started complaining. So the Taliban actually said, right, we're going to bring our guys in to patrol the streets to stop all this because there was a lot of um, NGOs that obviously we're in comms with who were saying, you know, our compound's just been broken into and people are, you know, stealing laptops and rifling through, etc. cetera. Um, and the Taliban actually came in and then restored order, you know, for those nights because there were no police anymore. Um, so they actually kept things quiet, you know, and for the rest of the time I was in Kabul, in our area, it was actually quiet because the Taliban were now the police. So we're we talking what three or four days before Operation Pitting started. We're we talking like the Tuesday, the Wednesday before, because I think the I think it was yeah. I think it took them three days, didn't it, to get to get that in play when they when the airport fell and you saw those horrendous scenes. Um, yeah, I think it was probably a couple of days it took them to actually get established on the ground to actually start working out some form of system. Who the, the Taliban are pitting or the other pitting, or the yeah, pitting to get okay, that? I, I know, I don't know when the US landed, but I think the 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 British contingent two power and that landed on a Sunday, I think. So we're talking, yeah, must be three or two or three days before that. Then is that when you're talking about this yeah, situation? I mean, you... the situation where the Taliban came in to police the city because the police weren't there anymore. No, I mean, and they took over all the police compounds. Um, so like if we had a problem, you know, we, we went to see them about one thing when one of, one of our um, horses got taken from our donkey sanctuary. So our staff went to the Taliban who are now in our police district HQ, you know, and the, the Taliban sorted that out straight away. Um, they got our horse back and our horses popped back, you know, where it came from. Um, so in some ways, you know, they, they were doing what they said on the, on the tin, which is just absolutely crazy. Um, but you going back, you said about obviously 16 air assault, you know, getting dropped into Kabul airport. I mean, you know, those guys and girls, you know, the, the ones who made up that force that came in, I mean, they were, they were just put in an absolutely horrendous situation. You know, they're totally put into a position where they're doing obviously an amazing job, but they shouldn't have been put into that. You know, that, that was the most ill thought out, you know, operation ever, you know, combined with the Americans. Um, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about it some more in a minute because um, we had first-hand experience of it. But, you know, those guys and girls were absolutely amazing. And I've got a feeling there's a lot of them who've come back who've seen a lot of sites that, you know, they should never have had to go through, you know, whatsoever. Um, and my heart goes out to some of them who had to deal with that, especially when we saw what was happening, you know, around, obviously, the Abbey Gate. Um, yeah, a lot of good guys and girls there who, who sadly now are probably going to have a few nightmares, I think, for quite some time. Yeah, we, I think we will come on to it. I was saying to uh, um, some friends the other day when we were talking, you know, I, like you, I served at Helmand. And uh, 
when I saw some friends who'd done what we, you know, I used to serve without the helmet before, go out and they're on up pitting. And I was thinking, man, I would not want to be on this one operation. I think, well, you would want to be on it if I was still in, because why wouldn't you, you know, go and, and try and help. But at the same time, like you said, just the most horrendous situation to be put in the middle of. Um, when your wife's flight got cancelled, what what was the thoughts then? What was the next step? Well, once the flights were cancelled, there was no commercial flights in or out of Afghanistan. So that's when it hit home that we were like, okay, okay, um, yeah, we need a new plan. Um, yeah, and obviously we didn't know with that withdrawal, you know, it hadn't yet been set up. So, um, yeah, the evac at the airport. So we would decide, right, we're going to have to sit tight. Um, and he, immediately that day, the Taliban come in. Um, yeah, obviously my wife was in like a just jeans, you know, and a T-shirt and that. And the staff like, right, you need to get changed. You know, and all our staff had gone from, like I said, their colourful kind of Western clothes that they turned up in each day to work. You know, they were now straight away went out and brought themselves these all dark, you know, outfits um, and really thick, heavy headscarves. Um, so we thought, you know, there's two choices here. Either we're going to be on this evacuation if it gets going, or we're going to have to just wait and sit it out. Um, obviously, wait and sit it out wasn't really an option we wanted because we didn't know how the Taliban would react to foreigners. So, yeah, it, it was um, worrying times. You know, we, we did sit there and just think, oh, crap, what are we going to do? You know, how, how are we going to get out of this? Um, and what is going to happen? Um yeah. Were you in touch with any other NGOs who were in a similar predicament? Yeah, we've, we've got a WhatsApp group of NGOs, you know, all the uh, head, you know, country heads, um, and all of them, you know, we're exactly the same, you know, like, okay, you know, they'd evacuated some staff, but they had other staff still left, because like I said, we all thought we had at least a month. Um, and so, yeah, they were all like, right, have you heard the news? I've got, you know, Taliban have, have just come to visit my NGO. Um, you know, they seemed OK. They didn't take anything. They've told us to be aware of criminality and report anything, you know. So everybody was in comms and other people, you know, is the airport open yet? You know, how do we evacuate? What happens? Um, so, yeah, we that was a really good group of people just, you know, chatting away and sharing all their information they could so we could all have a bigger picture of what was going on in Kabul. So when did the, the evacuation uh opportunity present itself at what point did you get that info and 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 see it as an option you mean from the airport yeah from because yeah. i'm like, assuming that from the airport yeah because i'm assuming well did you did a land move cross your mind again we thought about that um we've got enough contacts we thought about going through nangahar province and then across to pakistan um yeah that was one of our options that we were we had on the table um, once obviously 16 air assault had got themselves established obviously the Abbey Gate was now obviously open for business but obviously you saw that in those desperate first days people you know were, couldn't get through because of the mad crush of desperate people who you know a lot of them who who flown back to UK weren't on any list they just happened to be able to get through that door so I now you know speaking to a few people I mean you've got people in the UK that you know, they're like who the heck are you you know, what did you used to do in Afghanistan? Because they've got no documents, they've got no background. So that there's a big pot mess now going on of people who are back here who we don't know who they were because obviously, you know, they came through into that airport, um, you know, in that initial first few days of just total confusion. Um, so at the time, there was no call forward notices. What happens was once you on, um, you'd made yourself known to the British government or to the Americans or to whoever, like my wife's Norwegian. So you know, to the Norwegians, they would issue a call forward notice and then they would tell you which gate to go to. So there's actually four gates. You had North Gate, East Gate, Abbey Gate, and then the South Gate for the airfield. Um, the Americans ran the North and the East, and it was the Brits who had main responsibility for Abbey Gate. And then um, the South Gate was the Taliban Gate. Um, what do you mean, a Taliban so, Gate? Yeah. A Taliban yeah. Gate? Oh, so, they were, so the Taliban were controlling access to one part of the airport? Yeah, so the Taliban had the outer outer perimeter, but they also had the South Gate. So they controlled access to the South Gate. Who so were they, who were they letting in? <laughs> well, they had a list. So this is where it all gets rather complicated. 
they had a list of people that apparently the British or the Americans would give them. And if you turned up at the South Gate, they would then process you through. Um, and you'd actually get into the airport. And so for any of your you know, listeners who, who know Kabul Airport, who've been there, you'll remember where the old MiG fighter used to be in the little roundabout um, you know, as you went into the airport. Well, just further on from that is like the main frontage of the airfield of the airport and you've got a little fountain um and a big sign saying you know hamid karzai airport um and in there was a piece of barbed wire you know about i don't know 20 foot bit of barbed wire from between a little kind of roadway and on the other side of that was the british so the british were stood there you all tooled up and then on this side of the wire was the taliban all tooled up and because of all the equipment they'd you had taken um, when I first got there and I looked at that crossing point, I thought it was British stood on this side as well. And then when the guy turned around and I saw his face, I was like, bloody hell, because they had all the gear. They've got armoured piercing rounds now. We've literally tooled the Taliban up into a proper fighting force with all the equipment. It's just absolutely scary. So this guy was dressed exactly the same as all our guys. But the British can't cross that barbed wire. So everything from that piece of barbed wire all the way to the front of the airport, you've got to go through the Taliban. So unless your name's on a list, you're not getting in. So outside with me, when you know, jumping ahead to the, when I was trying to get through the airport, you know, there was British people outside. I had one guy come up to me. He's all right, mate. I was like, you're from London. He went, yeah, I'm a bus driver. <laughs> so I'm on holiday, see my parents. <laughs> he said, I can't get home. He said, my kids are all over there. Um, and I went over and talked to them. They all showed me their British passports and they're still there now. They didn't get out. So, you know, he's a bus driver from London, still stuck in Kabul. He couldn't get through the Abbey Gate. He couldn't get in the South Gate because he wasn't on the list. Um, it's just, it, it wasn't the lad's fault at all. You know, the guys and girls, like I said, did an absolutely amazing job in absolutely horrendous circumstances. You know, and ultimately when we had all the crushes, you know, and people were in that confusion, you know, you had all these 16 year assault guys and girls, you know, picking people out they could to try and, you know, save them from being crushed. Um, they should never have been put in that position. It was just so poorly thought out and rushed. Um, you know, the powers that be need to really take a good look at themselves because they totally screwed that up. How did you get to the airport from when you decided to leave the, the, uh, the compound? Because so, from, I'm just trying to recall, that yeah. was not a simple move, right? It was pretty... No, no. No, so I mean, my wife first, we had to get her out because I wanted to get her out of the picture and then I could obviously concentrate 100% on what I was doing. Um, so I needed to get her out. So we tried to get her to the airport the first time um, and she was called forward. So she had her piece of paper from the Norwegians and my country manager was, uh, she's American and she was 32 weeks pregnant. Um, and she's got a little son, a little year and a half old boy. So we wanted to get her out um you know she again was, was on her. Yeah, her. yeah oh okay yeah and we wanted to get her on a flight now she was due to again fly out commercially but obviously that had all been you know knocked on the head when turkish and emirates had stopped flying um so she she was getting called forward so we tried to get them through the abbey gate and that's when they got crushed up against the gate just too many people trying to get in um they're waving their passports up um you know soldiers um, sadly, by then we also had American soldiers on the Abbey Gate as well. Um, and because of the crush against the gate, the American soldiers thought it would be a good idea to shoot over the heads of everyone to drive them backwards. So they started shooting up in the air and that just caught a massive stampede going the other way. Um, so they got caught in that. Obviously, my wife's trying to you know, keep um, the country managers from being crushed on the floor. Um, and they... By the time they managed to get out of it, it was getting dark. So they couldn't come back to obviously where we were at Nauzad. So they had to go into a, a friend's house, a safe house we've got down near the airport. And that's where they spent the night because they just couldn't get into the Abbey Gate because of the volume of people and the crush that was going on. Um, so eventually they came back to Nauzad about, I think it was two days later. I think my wife finally got back up to where I was. Um and obviously my country manager as well, you know, and then we had to rethink the plan. But thankfully, the Americans were um, thinking ahead, which is good. Um, 
So we actually got told that there's going to be a knock to get the country manager and my wife out. Um, and they actually sent a, a car up and there was an SF team in the car who drove them up to a deserted spot of land away from where we were. And they brought a Black Hawk in, which picked them up and flew those two to the airport. Um, so that's how they got out. Obviously, I couldn't tell people at the time. I've been telling the press that we got them back in a couple of days later through the gate. We didn't. But obviously, I couldn't tell people how it was operating at the time because obviously these SF teams are out there. Obviously, you're getting vulnerable people off the ground and into the airport. How did they know where they were? Um, we'd um, Obviously, we're in comms with them. So we obviously dropped some pins on WhatsApp and they were like, right, we know where you are. Um, okay, we'll come out. We'll be out there at eight o'clock, make sure they're ready to go. You know, and these very uh, bearded people turned up at, yeah, like eight o'clock on the dock, put them in a the car, drove them off. And then, you know, next thing we heard was a helicopter go over the top. And then, you know, they were on their way to the airport, which gave me breathing space then, because then I could obviously, the only person I had to worry about was obviously the staff, my dogs and cats, and obviously me. Um, I didn't need to worry about my wife anymore. So where are the, where are the staff at this point? I, I take it they were just flipping between home and the and the clinic. Was the clinic still operating in some way, shape, or form? No. Well, the clinic was still operating. We still had our dogs and cats. We we uh, kept our female staff at home. We said, look, you've got the option to stay at home. Your families will come in. One of them wanted to come in because she said she couldn't just sit at home because you know her brain was just main meltdown, trying you know, thinking of all this the possibilities of what was about to happen. So she'd come into work. Um, but I lived obviously our house we lived with some of our Afghan staff anyway um, so you know one of our, our senior vet you know he lived across the hallway from me um, you know at night we'd sit and watch movies and stuff together you know and eat pizza and all that kind of stuff so um, yeah they were there and, and obviously just trying to go about looking after the animals but also preparing the animals ready for a move because you know by then we'd start Operation Ark which was you know, the mission to get the people and animals out on a privately funded flight. You know, you, obviously the flight's got a cargo hold. Um, you can't put people in the cargo hold. So obviously we put the animals in the cargo hold and then we put the people up in the passenger cabin. Um, and we had, with our immediate staff and their families, we had 68 um, staff or families and staff, you know, and our flight had seats for 230. So, you know, we, were, we said to the British government from a very early stage that once this flight lands, you can fill it up. Yeah, we've got no dramas with that. Um, and that's when I started getting obviously so annoyed that with the British government and that because I couldn't say it any clearer than that. You know, this is a privately funded flight. Um, I just need you to basically open a gate to let me in, you know, and that's it. And then we'll help you get extra people out of the country. Um, you know, and that's when it all started turning nasty and we're getting accused of using military resources. Um, you know, I'm sat here now talking to you and there were no military resources whatsoever used to get me into that airfield. Not one. Not one single resource. Um, and that really does, you know, wind me up when I still see in the press now people saying we use military resources or military aircraft or we use military people to load the plane. Um, I left after the British military. So it was actually US Marines who were just sat around on the flight line waiting for their flight out who helped us load the aircraft into the cargo hold. Um, it wasn't British, didn't load the aircraft at all. Why did the government not want to use the spare seats on the plane? Because I'd, obviously for them, you know, it, we were distraction from the fact that, you know, you still have interpreters and people who work for the government. You know, you still have them sat on the ground in Kabul now because, like I said, it was such a poorly planned op. Um, you know, and, and I, again, I'm, I want to go to town on some of these ministers over this. Yeah, we stopped combat operations, the British, in Afghanistan in 2014. So we've had since 2014 to get these interpreters out and people who work for the government. Why did they try and rush it in just 10 days? You know, they knew Donald Trump was withdrawing from Afghanistan back in January 2020. Yet they only just put some emphasis on getting interpreters out in the last two weeks. Um you know, they would they were never going to get everybody through those gates at the airport. There's just no way on this planet. Um, and when I finally got in, so remember I, I got into the airfield after it was closed. 
So I didn't get in while the airfield was still taking people through the door. I got in afterwards. How and um, um, via, obviously, the South Gate, um, I had four different Taliban checkpoints to go through. Um, so it was a case of convincing them, pleading with them, um, finally you know, getting an escort from the Taliban, which is our whole new story, um, to get to the actual front gate of the airport. Um, where obviously my name was on a list that said you know, that you know this guy should be turning up. He's a British national, um, and finally I convinced them that my name was on a list they needed to go and find, which they found. Um, and they were like, "We don't care. You got a British passport. You can just go. We we don't care about you. We want you out of our country. You're a foreigner. Just get out." Um, but they wouldn't take my staff, even though the staff had all the relevant paperwork from the British government. Because finally, the British government actually issued this paperwork. If they had given me that paperwork three days earlier, I'd have got my staff out. But they gave me a phone call. That's obviously one of the reasons why I went ballistic on somebody's voicemail. Um, <laughs> was because they'd given me a verbal, your staff are cleared, but they wouldn't give me the paperwork. And because they delayed giving me the paperwork, by the time they had given it to me, Biden had changed the rules and he'd closed the airfield. So, you know, he'd closed it for new people to come in because they knew they couldn't airlift everybody out if they let any more people in by the deadline of the 31st. So my staff were turned away at gunpoint and, you know, that's why they're still there. So Biden had overall command of that airport then in terms of uh, in what happened access-wise? Oh, 100%. The yeah, yeah okay. the, the Brits didn't. We were just a very small part of that operation you know we had that one gate um you know and that that was it we and i think there was a lot of friction you know from hearing the voices on the ground there was a lot of friction between the british and the americans it wasn't you know i think this special relationship you know that we all go on about you know we don't have that anymore um you know we were given a you know a very hard time you speak to the guys and girls there you know it wasn't it wasn't smooth operating with the americans at all yeah, I suppose when, when is it ever when it's on a, a large scale like that? I think we, we do things differently, right? For different reasons. Um, so you, your staff, I, at what point did they decide that they wanted to, they needed to bug out? As in, the, the, you know, because before we were talking and when everything was rosy, they were, they, you know, they had no intention of coming, maybe visiting the UK, but obviously with, with things about to get very bad in Kabul, they made a decision that they wanted to leave. When did that come? I wonder how their um, families, their extended families took that. <laughs> yeah, I think it's all the reports that came from, you know, out in the provinces. Um, you know, so like my you know, female staff, they're all single, uh, you know. So, you know, their parents are like, if you've got the opportunity to go, leave. You know, and I said to them all, look, you know, you know because these remember this, this Taliban were now going door to door and looking for people who work for the government. Um, you know, and obviously, like I said, it wasn't a secret that obviously, you know, I used to be a Royal Marine. Um, so they're basically working for me, you know, and they, you know, again, part of our PR, as you mentioned earlier, was all about the soldier rescue. You know, so these people had helped American soldiers, British soldiers look after a dog. Well, there's two things the Taliban don't like for a start. Um, so it was, you know, we th were like, well, hang on a minute, you know, and, our staff also, they all had ISAF passes um, for, you know, the, the main camp in Kabul because we did all the work for the working dogs there. So you've seen a lot, I think, about the biometric data that the Taliban may now have because the Americans left all that there. I mean, just really? You've had a year and a half plan this and you leave all the biometric data. I mean, come on. So, you know, my staff all had ISAF passes. So Do you want to explain was... for... Sorry, go on. Yeah, so... So the biometric data said so to get onto like ISAF base, you'd have obviously all your eyes scanned, your retina scanned, um, you know, and all of this data was kept. And we had to have passes to get on there to deal with the working dogs at the um, uh, US Embassy, ISAF, um, which became Resolute Support, um, the big NATO base in Kabul. Um, we also supported the British Embassy, Canadian Embassy, Japanese Embassy. You know, so our, our team's data was all over the place. So we were like, well, if you get interpreters out because they work for the British government, well, so these, you know, 
yes, some of you might think, well, they're only veterinarians, but, you know, they've supported, you know, the working dogs and the Taliban absolutely cannot, you know, they hate working dogs because when I was driving through the checkpoints, I had obviously my two trucks full of dogs and cats. I had so many of them were shoving phones in my faces with pictures of a Taliban detainee at Guantanamo Bay, at uh, Guantanamo Bay, um, being obviously, you know, with a working dog in his face, um, blindfolded, you know, in their orange suits, and they've got this working dog being, you know, barking and, you know, growling in their faces. So they absolutely hate them. They wanted to shoot the dogs I had because they said these are all working dogs. And I had to get one of the dogs out of the crate and prove to them it was just this skinny little, you know, street dog. You know, that it wasn't a working dog um you know pretend they were all my pets you know and i was taking them home um otherwise they wanted to shoot the lot so you know our staff were in danger because of that because they'd helped obviously the government with these working dogs they'd helped soldiers with their dog rescues so that's why we then decided we needed to get them all out what was that like approaching that first taliban checkpoint and and, and having to try and get through as a as a white Westerner, next huh. one Marine. How did that feel? Um, but well, we had two, going. Well, we had two trucks um, with off dogs and cats, and we had two buses with all our staff in. So the buses were following behind the trucks. So I was in the lead truck, sat in the middle. So there's me sat here. Um, driving it is my office manager, a guy called uh, Farid, and sat next to me is Mustafa, uh, my senior vet. Um, both great guys, both speak um, perfect English. And we're, we're driving down the road. We'd literally gone, I think, like 400 yards from my house. And these four uh, Taliban ran out from the checkpoint they're at. Um, as soon as they ran out, um, they I uh, watched them do it. And I'll, this will remain with, with me forever. Um, they cocked their rifles. Um, and then they pointed them straight at us in the cab. Um, fingers on the trigger. And then one of them had an ND. Oh my god! Um, and we were all sat there like that, and it Hands just up. went over the top of the cab, and all four, all three of us sat in the cab were just like, and I've never heard an Afghan swear in English before, but I did that night. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ! And they kept us like that. Um, another truck turned up, another truck turned up, and we, you know, just to keep focus, so we were. I said, the guys count, let's find out how many we've got here. And by the time they'd finished, we had 40 Taliban surrounding all four vehicles. Um, and they kept us like that at gunpoint for an hour while they um, decided what to do with us. Um, wouldn't let us leave. We were sat like this. Um, so you sat what? your hands up the entire time? The entire time, yeah, in the trucks. What did they um, want to know? They like, where are you going? Why, why are you going to the airport? And I was like, right, we've all got permission. You know, I said, it's well broadcast that the Taliban have offered safe passage to all those who need to get to the airport. But what, what people got to remember, the Taliban isn't like one functioning organization. The Taliban is so many different groups, you know, of some aren't Taliban. They're just warlords who have thrown their hat in the ring with the Taliban. So this group we had were probably five miles from the airport. So they're just a group of Taliban. They don't know what the main Taliban are doing. They've just been told to hold this checkpoint, you know, out in the outskirts. So we had to convince them that we had the right paperwork. Because remember, they can't read. So there's no point in me showing them the paperwork because it's just a bit of paper to them. Explain um, that a bit. Explain that for people about the they can't read bit, please. Yeah, please, I mean, so these are literally, um, you know, Young men, really, young men from the provinces who the only option they had in life was really to join the Taliban because, you know, out in the provinces, the economy wasn't fantastic. You know, there's not work. Um, you know, and the Taliban offer a better choice moving forward. So, you know, they joined who they thought would be the winning side. Um, so they're given a rifle. You know, that's why we, we had that ND. You know, because there's no weapons handling drills. You know, they've been given a weapon, basic tuition on it and then that's it so you know all of them had their fingers on the trigger and it's just that's the heart stopping moment because you realize it's not that they want to shoot you but they just forget they don't know what they're doing you know and all the time you'd you know, hear nds going off 
you know, where people have got a finger on the trigger walking around with a loaded rifle. And it's just so scary. So these guys can't read or write. They've never been to school. Um, so, you know, the paperwork we had to them meant nothing. You know, so they were they're making phone calls. Um, I actually had one one kid. I've got I've got his picture on my phone and that. And um, well, I've, I've really obviously let the relevant authorities know about it. But um, while we sat there for that hour, one of them came to the cab door and he opened the door and he rested his AK-47 on my senior vet's lap. <laughs> um, but he's like, can you get me to England? I need to go to England. And I was like, of course I can. Yeah. Well, what do you need? He said, well, <laughs> can you tell them, you know, that I, I should be allowed in? I said, brilliant. I said, as soon as I get in the airport, you guys get me in the airport. I said, I'll go straight to the British tent. I said, tell you what, have you got any ID on you? And he said, yes. So I took photographs of his ID. And I said, as soon as I get to the airport, I'll let them know that obviously you need to get some clearance so you can come into the airfield too. Um, I said, you just got to get me to that airport. He's like, yeah, yeah, no problem, no problem. That's what we work on. He said, oh, brilliant, thank you. Um, it was just crazy. They got the Taliban with a gun asking me if I can get him into England. So clearly I've, I have given his details to the correct authorities, just not the ones he wanted me to give them to. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, I mean, the illiterate, the, the, the percentage of people in Afghanistan who are illiterate, yeah, you're right. It's, you're absolutely right. It's, it's huge, isn't it? And it's, it's one out of, well, a lack of education. They don't have like a formal education system in most of Afghanistan. And then two, it's, it's not really a need for them to read or write. When you, you know, you think about Hellman, I think back. But I remember also that that sort of culture, when I was sort of in... Uh, young in my experience of Afghan and, and, and working along, like I say, working with those people or dealing with those people is that you could show them a piece of paper. You could be talking, yeah, blah, 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 blah. And hold up a document as a reference point. And they would pretend like they understood it would be, you know, it would be in Arabic and they would pretend like they understood what you're talking about because, but again, part of the culture is uh, not wanting to not, do something you ask for or understand something isn't it so they won't let on that they can't read those for the inexperienced people you know it's uh yeah so like you said paperwork means nothing which makes it all the more challenging um when they made the decision to let you through that first checkpoint did that was that just something they did in the fly from on the ground or did they get do you know if they got information from some you know the, the yeah they, they were on the phone for ages and different commanders turned up asked us different questions they were on the phone uh, they then had a Shura, you know, meeting um, where they all sat down in the street and discussed it. And then they came back to us and said, right, we will give you an escort to the airfield. So we actually had a Taliban escort moving forward to the airfield. Um, and that was the first time with all the staff, you know, all my dogs and cats. Um, and we got to the airfield. They would only take us within 200 metres of that bottom gate because they didn't have authority they said to go any further with the taliban who were at the gate so they dropped us off and then we had to wait while we went forward to try and negotiate then bringing our you know vehicles through with the staff on to get through those next set of gates um and that's you know that became just a waiting game then we actually sat through we got there i think like two in the morning um we didn't get to go forward until nearly, I think it was about five o'clock in the evening. So we spent the whole day just waiting out in the sun, obviously trying to keep the dogs and cats cool, um, you know, feeding obviously the staff. And, you know, um, thankfully there was a local mosque along there so we could use the toilets of the mosque, you know, because obviously we've got women and children. Um, yeah, and it took us a long time to then get permission that we could move forward to go into the actual airfield. Um, and when we did get permission to go forward from the Taliban, we got obviously 300 metres inside, got to the next Taliban checkpoint. And that's when they said, no, you're not bringing your Afghan staff in. Um, you know, that they're not allowed to leave. And I said, why? They've got all the paperwork. And this is, again, I'm in the middle of the street having a sure I'm sat down with this Taliban commander. And he said, well, Joe Biden said now that you can only come in if you've got a valid passport. We're not. He's not allowing anybody to come in without a passport. And this is and the Taliban saying this? This is the Taliban, yeah. So they've been told by the Americans who to let in. So they're basically doing crowd control. 
Um, and I sat there on my you know, hands and knees and I begged this Taliban commander. I was like, look, they've got permission. The British checkpoint is just up there. Let them in. Um, and at gunpoint, they said no. They stuck an AK in my face and said no. Um, they said, you can go through or you can go out. It's your choice. So I said, well, I'll go out with my staff. I'm not, I'm not going through on my own. Um, I'm so glad I made that decision to go back out with them because the second that I said that was when the two suicide bombs went off at the Abbey Gate, which was literally about half a kilometre away from where we were stood. Um, obviously, the Taliban went into panic. Obviously, we had to get out of the airport. Um, and because of where the Abbey Gate is, so the Abbey Gate is like a closed dead-end road here, and the airport roundabout where we were coming out is here. So all those people who were affected by that bomb blast yeah, who weren't injured are now running back to this roundabout. So if I'd have sent my staff out on their own, they'd have been caught up in that, just them. So thankfully, we all went out together um, so we could keep you know tabs on the vehicles, make sure everybody got through that. We got tear gassed. Um, the Taliban were shooting up in the air with their AKs, trying to disperse people, hitting people with sticks. I mean, it's just horrendous. Because of the panic, Fine. everyone fleeing the yeah. Abbey Gate everywhere. Ev yeah, area. exactly. Yeah. They had no idea if there was any more suicide bombers in there. Um, you know, it, it was just absolutely horrendous. And obviously trying to drive a truck while you're getting tear gassed. Um, you know, it's just absolutely epic. Um, but we managed to get just away from the gate, pull over, you know, obviously wash our eyes out. Um, so we could actually see again, you know, and you've got women and kids in the back who are all thrown up. And, you know, you know I hadn't even thought about the animals up on the truck because they all got tear gassed as well. That's why, sadly, we lost six of our cats now. Um, because obviously, you know, as you well know, you know, the tear gas sticks on your clothes. So once the cats, you know, had got through that cloud, they're obviously stinging, they're trying to lick themselves. So they're actually obviously taking the tear gas inside. And that's how. Sadly, they died from um, ulcers caused by that gas. Um, but we got all the staff back eventually to the clinic. It took us about three hours to get back. It's normally like a 15-minute drive. It took us three hours to get back. Um, so you could have you could have been you could have been out at this point, right? You could yeah, have been could through, have get the plane, and you bugged yeah, out. Yeah, they said to me, "You can go now if you want." But obviously, I wasn't. I wasn't just going to bash the staff at the gate, and I'm you know so glad I didn't. Um, yeah, we got back to the house, you know, there was tears, everybody's, you know, upset, distressed. Um, obviously sorting the, you know, the kids and stuff out, making sure everybody's obviously, you know, washed their faces and that and obviously drunk lots of water. Um and then, you know, we we made a new plan for obviously the next day. You know, the staff were like, Well, that's it, you've got to go. Um, and I'm straight on obviously a call to our crisis team that we'd set up here in the UK loads of absolutely amazing people who were supporting us, um, you know, with their time, you know, making plans and ringing people and sorting like the, you know, the chartered flight out. Um, yeah. And we're saying, right, how do we do this? And we, can we do a road move for the staff? You know, what do we do? Do I just go now or do I stay? And we go via Nangahar and we try and go that way. Um, and that's when the decisions were made that it's best for me to go get the dogs and cats out and then we've only got to deal with the staff without any animals. Um, so that's why that decision was made and why I went back the next day then to try and get back in the airport again for a, the second day in a row. And what were you met with that? What, what were you met with then? But in fact, a question for you. So as the, as the situation started changing in the airport and it was obvious that uh, the coalition forces was beginning to pull out, Biden made that decision you know, right? Only people with valid passports. Did the did you see the attitude of the Taliban changing? Because it seems, it seems to me, from an onlooker's perspective, from back here in the UK, that they were being, and it sounds like it so far, that they were being very, very, very cooperative, and very, very almost progressive in the way they were compared to what they were previously, in the way they were going about things. For example, well, having a conversation with you instead of shooting you straight dead, right? For example, um not taking all of those people, all of these staff and their families off the bus for trying, even just trying to get out. Um, did that situation change? Their attitudes change over the time of that, that couple of days as coalition presence was dwindling down and uh, their authority, as in a Taliban authority, is becoming more, uh, being able to assert it more? Yeah, I think, you know, 
for you know whatever we think of the Taliban, you know, the Taliban of 20 years ago isn't the Taliban leadership of now. Um, I don't know if you know, your your listeners you know saw that Taliban press conference. You know that was all educated guys, well educated guys who sat in that you know press conference. So I think you know they had the common sense to realise well they've won. You know they they have given you know America a bloody nose. Um, you know and America has run away with their tail between their legs. So they realised all they've got to do is keep this going you know, supporting this withdrawal effort in some form for a little while. And then they've got the country, you know, creating resistance would have meant the Americans had to stay longer. So they realized if they just helped, you know, in their, in their own little way, they could actually get this job done. And then obviously the country's theirs. Um, you know, and you've just got to see now what, you know, 31st, I don't know what it is now, like four days later, yeah, and the Qataris are already at the airport now trying to reopen it. Um, you know, so the Taliban have, you know, will be recognised in some form or fashion, whether America likes it or not. Um, you know, so I think they were just sensible and actually went, yeah, we'll support their withdrawal. We won't totally help them, but we'll support it just to make sure they get out of this country. Yeah, and that's what they did. Um, and when I went back for that, you know, the second day, again, you know, I had to convince the outer ring of Taliban that, you know, I, I was meant to be able to get to the airport because obviously they don't have, you know, these direct lines of communication yet. But once I got to the airport, yeah, the inner circle of Taliban were like, yep, yeah, yeah, okay, he's British. Yeah, where you go? And then, yeah, they were like, dogs, cats, don't care. Um, just go. They have played a blinder. They have played, I think, a blinder. Of the Taliban, they have. I'd be completely Absolutely. surprised. I remember um, a few days ago, it was the first airstrike by the US, a drone strike. And uh, the Taliban released a statement of some way, shape, or form. I mean, there we go. The Taliban released a statement, right? And then, yep, and it, <laughs> think and, about and it. it yeah. And I know, yeah. And it, and it said that they, they welcomed the strike by the US on ISIS, on the ISIS K target. Like, say that again. The Taliban welcomed the strike on the target of Afghanistan, ISIS K. He just did. They're, like you said in that press conference, very educated people. That they, their PR machine <laughs> is unbelievable at the moment. You know. Yeah, people, totally. So yeah, they've had a little bit of plan, that. haven't they? Yeah. The the guy, you know, one of them, I spoke with an absolute perfect Australian accent. So he's been obviously through university. You know, except she's probably got a master's degree in, you know, PR and, you know, social media, all of that kind of stuff. It's just absolutely, you know, crazy to think about. But hopefully, you know, you never know. Maybe they have changed. Maybe I'll eat my words in a year's time. You know, I'll be going back because actually they're not the old Taliban. Who knows? But um, I didn't want to be around to find out. I'll be quite no. happy to find out whilst I'm safely out of Afghanistan. And well, it doesn't look like the way at the minute. What's the situation with your staff at the moment in uh, in Kabul? Are they all safe or are they, what's going down? Yeah, so they're safe um, for now. Um, uh, we've obviously stopped all operations. We don't have an operation anymore. Um, so we're still working. The crisis team we set up here is still working desperately hard behind the scenes. Yeah, we're tempting all avenues we've got to get them out. Um, so we're still going for that because obviously, you know, we had this amazing response, you know, and everybody supported us, you know, all the general public, um, people from around the world. It's just been absolutely phenomenal, phenomenal. Um, you know, the love and compassion people have shown towards the staff is just, well, I, I, I still can't, you know, it hasn't all sunk in really. Um, so we've raised funds to, you know, help them with this transit. Um, and then when they actually do get out of Afghanistan, you know, resettling in the UK, um, I never knew it um, until we started all this. But apparently there's a shortage of vet you know, qualified veterinarians in the UK. Um, so these guys, you know, we've had job offers for them, retraining, um, you know, all sorts. So, you know, they're not going to be a burden on the taxpayer when they comes back, when they come back, because we've you know, we've got funds in place now to help them settle, support them, um, you know, make sure they actually become you know part of again the solution in the uk to actually you know this shortage we've got of veterinarians you know and for all those people who've got dogs and cats you know they're they're quite happy to have veterinarians when they need it so 
um, you know, that's our plan still. We're still working on that. Um, obviously, I can't give any details out because, you know, we don't want, in case things do t- turn nasty, you know, anybody else to know how we're going to do it. What's the what's been what's the comms been like since since you now now you're out of that situation with um key people within the government the uk I, I, you know obviously there's a lot of friction going on are you getting any and is there any way <laughs> has there been a change of attitudes or any assistance or anything like that going down i'll give you two guesses mate what do you reckon <laughs> no no and no i've heard nothing from anybody about anything um Obviously, you know, I saw that, um, you know, I didn't know anything about my voicemail um, being released. I mean, and I, I tell you now, hand on heart, um, and I've said, I don't actually remember making it. Um, you know, it was, it was total stressed out, um, you know, emotional couple of days, well, a long few days. And obviously when we knew that we weren't going to get in the airport before the paper had been issued, you know, we thought that was it. So I'm guessing it must have been that night. And one of my trustees said that when I spoke to them, um, they knew I wasn't headed in the right direction. But obviously, I don't remember making that call. And because I was at the airport waiting for our commercial flight out, um, I didn't have any data on my phone. So it wasn't until I arrived you know, back at um, Heathrow with the dogs and cats and you know, spoke to people. And they were like, yeah, that voicemail you left getting a bit of traction in the press. And I was like, what were you on about? Um, yeah, and then I was like, oh, oh. <laughs> um, yeah, and then, so that was all a big shock to me. So I'm still surprised now. I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. But, you know, I thought they'd have better things to be doing than releasing that. Because like I said, there are still hundreds of interpreters, people who work for the government, you know, actual British citizens, um, British school children who are stuck in Kabul, um, you know, regardless of what anybody says about me getting my truck through, well, that wouldn't have got, you know, wouldn't have got all those people out. So I think the government's probably got, you know, should have better priorities than worrying about me, to be brutally honest. Yeah, I think the problem is, Penn, they didn't, they didn't count how how, uh, how much attention you'd get, I think, that's the thing. And so... Uh, <laughs> very very um what's the word you know stressful times for everyone very very difficult time for the government and uh yeah i think they would have preferred a good news story to be front and center as opposed well, yeah. to but an that's the thing, marine commando it? going berserk yeah but that's the thing isn't it if if you know we had a commercial flight so no no cost to the military no military assets you know my staff had got their permission to get you know to get onto that airfield if they'd have given all that to us as and when we needed it, you know, we went through the South Gate. People, you know, Brits could only really go through the Abbey Gate. So if they'd have let me just get the people, you know, give us the paperwork so we could have got through when we actually wanted to, like two days before, um, you know, we did our first attempt, we'd have been out there and it would have been a good news story. You know, we'd have been gone on our flight. We'd have taken a whole load more people with us. It would have been a good news story for the UK government. Instead, they're the ones who've made this into what it is. I wouldn't have had all that popularity because we'd have been out and gone, you know? Um, and I, I, I don't understand. Them releasing my voice, man, all they've done is now make it worse because I'm not going to just sit around and, you know, listen to all that. I mean, people have, I've had people accuse me of putting donkeys on a flight instead of people. I'm like, I didn't rescue any donkeys from Afghanistan. Where are, you, where are you getting this rubbish from? And I've seen a couple of people on Twitter, you know, fairly respected journalists who are pushing this rubbish out. So, you know, now, you know, I've, I've got no choice but to obviously defend my name and defend what we tried to do. Um, you know, the MOD didn't help. When I got to the airfield, um, I was given a, a chaperone who told me uh, from the British military saying, you're not allowed to tweet, don't do anything. I said, I'm not going to. I said, I'm in the airfield now. So I'm just going to wait for my flight. We'll look after the dogs and cats. He said, don't you tweet a thing. He said, because you're not out yet. So, you yeah, know, we can't afford anything to go wrong. I said, I'm not, not going to tweet a thing. Half hour later, I got a phone call from my wife and she's like, have you seen what the MOD have tweeted? <laughs> and I was like, no. And the MOD tweeted that they were helping me load my aircraft and it'd be taken off soon. 
<laughs> we didn't even have an aircraft and we're still sat in a hangar. I was like, so I went back up to my chaperone and I was like, you know, you told me not to tweet. You went, oh my God, you haven't, have you? I said, I haven't, but you have. And then he was like, oh no, why did they do that? So the MOD tweeted, I'd left Afghanistan. I think it was 12 hours before I actually left Afghanistan. So, um, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it was weird. It was just, they're the ones that create this mess, you know? I can, I can understand it from the guy in the ground point of view, as in, as in don't do anything because it's a, that's basic you know security thing just keep it's an op going on uh, a uh, what's, uh, a high um what's the word high profile you know task going on i.e you you are getting out and so it's a, it's a security thing i'll be a bit over the top but then again the mod the mod's on pr machine doing their doing their thing and then they did it and we were panicking then because obviously our flight still had not got clearance to land so you know and the obviously the you know, the british military guys then with me knew that so we were like well hang on now they've said we've left but they haven't actually cleared us to come in yet in, in real terms so that they put pressure on themselves <laughs> we were just sat there and actually we just sat there giggling because we were just like you couldn't make this up you know they <laughs> They who, who put you, the pressure on themselves. Is it just you at the moment, like with the chaperone? Yeah, so you and the yeah. Animals, I had yeah. a couple of um, some of the para lads came in. Uh, we had a giggle as well about the fact that it was like um, the, you know, they were like, "Oh, paras have come to the rescue of a marine," and I was like, "Fellas, don't go there. Just don't go there." <laughs> um, but I mean, and but those lads, I mean, they came in. They were shattered, absolutely shattered. You know the the look on their faces and everything, you know, and they'd been out the Abbey Gate, you know, constantly, um, you yeah, know, and it looked, you know, like they'd just been in non-stop battle. Um, you know, I mean, they're a good bunch of lads. Um, you yeah, know, they asked if they could help us with the Dalton Cats, you know, and they helped us with some of them we needed, but, you know, basically they got their heads down. I didn't want to wake them up, you know, to um, to help me out because obviously they, they looked like they needed to, the downtime and then I got my head down for about an hour and I woke up and I've got a photo of it but there's one of the uh the para lads is actually walking one of the dogs around this little hangar we're in um he's taking him out of his crate and he's walking him around um yeah so yeah, guys and girls on the ground were absolutely amazing you know but the powers that be nah they totally and utterly without doubt messed this up in hindsight how do you think it should have been handled now, immediately they said they're going to do this withdrawal and they're going to set up this airhead. They needed to push out from the perimeter um, and not push out as in Taliban held areas, but like the, the Abbey Gate should have been a processing centre like four miles away from the airport. So Afghans went there to be processed and then you had marked buses that were then driven down with a Taliban escort that could have gone straight into that south gate you know and so it's a bus service basically and then each day you change the location of the processing center you know on the outskirts of Kabul without a doubt and we said this straight on that's what you've got to do because you're trying to get you know the, the Abbey Gate is, is like that a door you're trying to get thousands of people through a small door it was never going to happen and you know obviously all these bomb threats well of course there was going to be you know, mass casualties if you allowed people to congregate as they did in such a small enclosed space. Um, you know, and it's, it's just terrifying to to think of what happened there at that gate with those two suicide bombers. Um, you know, the Americans, sadly, you know, they lost 13 US Marines and 25, 25 Marines are like life-changing injuries. Um, I spoke to some of the medics um, when I was just sat in the airfield waiting, so you know they they were kind of around. So I spoke to a few people. Um, yeah, the, the, they're some of those medics who had to deal with that. Uh, yeah, they're they're gonna need help and support when they get home. That's for sure. Um, because yeah, it was just absolutely horrific. I think 130 people lost their lives that in that blast, those two blasts. Um, you know, thankfully I was talking to the the paras. You know, they just pushed out away from that area. 
you know, literally before. just pushed out to make the perimeter a bit bigger. Otherwise, they would have been in that. You know, so they pushed out and the Americans were left actually at the gate. And that's why, you know, sadly, it was only American casualties and not British soldier casualties. Um, you know, it's just, it's just devastating. It's just, it didn't need to happen. Absolutely did not need to happen. You know, we, we could have planned that so much better for the evacuation. And I'll, you know, I will stand there and I hope in the future there's going to be some inquiries as to why this all happened because people need to answer for this. You know, not only they destroy a country, but, you know, we've left people behind. And right now, I don't see any plans to get those people out. As in British people? Yeah, I mean, you heard that once that suicide bombing happened, that um, certain ministers said, well, now people should get to the borders, you know. Sweet pea. Mm -hmm. We nearly done, mate. I know you. I know. It's, uh, <laughs> That's all right. I'm, I'm, just getting, I'm just getting the wets in. So I know. I saw um, the, the new <laughs> team. I saw the same. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, no, uh, they said get to the borders. You know, now the airport's closed, so you need to get to the borders. Well, as of today, and we're what again, five days later, the um, borders with Pakistan, Iran, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, they're all closed. So the British government told people to get to the borders and people can't cross. So these are genuine people with their bit of paper that told them they were going to be evacuated, they're now stuck at the border crossings. I mean, how long does it take to get this you know, sorted out? It should have been a priority. They should have been planning this. So, you know, we've known for all this time that you know, this day was coming and it hasn't happened. So, you know, I can rant forever on this. It's, I, I just do not believe that we have not got it in place yet to help these people get out of Afghanistan because all we've done is put all the people that the Taliban wanted We've now put them in one place at the border. This is this is just crazy, and it people need to know, and we need to, you know, get rid of the people in charge who've made these absolutely horrendous decisions, which is totally affecting people's lives, and actually get people in place who actually know how to run a country and know how to run these kind of things. Well, we never seem to learn, Pam. And when I say we, I mean, yeah, you're right. We you never don't. seem to learn from, especially from military. I'm going to say mistakes, not just mistakes, military. Military events, we never seem to learn. It's absolutely madness. And especially in a day and age now where it's not like it's a thousand years ago, we're trying to pass on lessons from history throughout, is on, yeah. you know, on flipping scriptures. It's not, we, you know, we've got all the information we need from previous, previous evacuation situations, previous, you know, overthrows of countries. And we, we know it all. We should learn these lessons and we should have learned these lessons. And put things in place and, and why not i mean why don't we flip a neck politics money yeah I mean, egos attitudes it's yeah, just it's totally absolutely totally yeah you've got your you know the the guys and girls on the ground you know i said like all throughout you know this last 20 years so you know you know all the you know the army navy air force marines you know all of us you know who served in afghanistan you know, everybody did their job to the best of their ability and did a bloody good job. You know, and we lost so many people, you know, in that endeavour. Um, you know, and like the guys and girls now, 16 Air Assault, did the job they had to do to the best of their abilities in absolutely horrendous circumstances. You know, it's not the military people who have, you know, caused any of these problems. They were part of the solution. You know, they brought security to Afghanistan. Yet it's politicians... You know, those people in, in power who who have no idea, like you said, haven't learned from what we've just, you know, been through. And again, they've, you know, they've destroyed a country. They've The last 20 years now, what was it for? You know, all those sacrifices we had from the military, you know, I always used to defend, you know, what we did and, you know, sadly the loss of life. Because I said, well, you know, part of that mission, we brought security. You know, the young girls who worked at Nauzad were just five and six years old when we first went into Afghanistan. And the security that British troops fought for and sacrificed for allowed them to go to school, to become educated and be part of the solution of Afghanistan. It was heading in the right direction. All we've done today now, and like you just said, the we, the, the powers that be, we've just given Afghanistan back to now a fully armed 
Taliban. So we went from, you know, flip-flop wearing AK-47 carrying Taliban to now body armoured, uh, body piercing, you know, they've even got helicopters. There was a Black Hawk flying over Kandahar yesterday, for crying out loud. You know, so what was that last 20 years for? What, what, did, what did we achieve now? Because we've just given it back to them. Well, mm, question a lot of people are asking, right? And, and this is the way I'm looking at it, is that, because again, I'm, I'm like you, mate, I've got, you know, I'm emotionally invested mm. in Afghanistan. You know, for, for all the same reasons as many of us are, as an ex-military are, or still people are still serving are, you know? And the way I look at it is, well, like you can't really answer that question yet, I don't think. It all depends on the next year, two years of what, even six months of, and we actually see what, what, what the Taliban doing. We actually see what it turns out like, because part of me thinks that in terms of rationalizing that 20 years, right. Part of me thinks that, okay, it's a real bit of, this is a real bit of pill to swallow at the moment. For a lot of us, yeah. with the Taliban being in control. However, what if, they are not the same beast as they were, well, they're not the same beast as they were 20 years ago or even a year ago, even six months ago, right? And what if the way Afghanistan is in a year's time is better than what it was 20 years ago, right? With all that's happening in between, then there is an argument to be made, well, that improvement, if it's not marginal, that improvement, if an improvement is to be seen, would not, could not have come about if it wasn't for the 20 years. But that improvement has to be huge. It can't just be a marginal thing. It's some little sort of Taliban policy changes, you know, they're a little less oppressive to women. They're a little less, uh, you know, um, reliant on the flipping narcotics trade. They're a little less uh, strict with the Sharia law, for example. But again, it remains to be seen, you know, it's something that can't be answered yet, I think. And the other complication to it is that different people like you it's going to be a different situation needed for you to sort of re reconcile it in your mind and be accepted or yeah. not accepted or not to what it is for me and everybody else and again going back to you talking about the guys and girls who are on that op pitting man you know some of those people who, who were there a lot who were on the op they did the helm as the herricks you know and they've they've seen the the whole thing to to go from seeing their mates killed to being them being there and seeing the, the country just being handed over, and then and then and you alluded to it, and then being and this is what people don't understand. I think when we, when you talk about how difficult it is the situation you're in to be put into that situation, and you could say, oh well, it's not the same as being shot at or whatever. No, it's worse because you were there every single hour of every single day. There are people like you and me. And young lads and young ladies from different units are out there. And they're having to look at thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people who are screaming, pleading, crying, dying at that airport on the outskirts because they want to get out because of what's happening in Afghanistan. And those men and women who are there in the uniform know that all those people are not getting out, only a yeah. fraction. And they have to leave knowing that people there are not going to be alive in a month's time or even a week's time because they'll just be assassinated and they have to live with that you know yeah ab absolutely and it's you know it, it, putting them in that position where they had to make a choice of which person they pulled out of the crowd you know and which person stayed that's that's not something that should have been put on them at all um you know and, and like i said this lies squarely on the the politicians and i and I get what you say, you know, maybe in a year's time, the Taliban will be different and maybe it will be, you know, a better Afghanistan in the fact of what it could have been from 20 years ago. Um, but it already was a better Afghanistan heading in the right direction. Um, you know, and, and like I said, just, you know, just like the, some of the politics that's going on, you know, like right now, you know, we're talking about all these people stuck in, you know, at the border. Um you know, they've got people now in refugee camps, you know, in all the places that were set up. So you've got some in Abu Dhabi, you know, et cetera, being processed. Um, you know, some of the politicians, this is some of the, the Americans as well. 
um you got people there and they say well we you know because my wife's still working with some of her girls to get them out you know and to get those onto other friendly countries um they've been told today they there can't be anything processed today because it's a sunday you're like hang on a minute um for those refugees it's not a sunday they're stuck in you know hell in a camp with only what they escaped afghanistan you know on their backs that's it um yeah we shouldn't be having days off we should be non-stop trying to sort this mess out um it's, it's just crazy no one was prepared for this and no one seemed to be prepared to get the solution so and it's just it's crazy you know this is an emergency you don't stop work just because it's a sunday in the middle of an emergency um it just it drives me mad. Absolutely drives me mad. Well, uh, we're going to start wrapping it up, mate. Um, my my HR patron sent through some specific questions for you. Um, when I let yep. them know last night, and I put the OPSEC on them as well, don't tell. I don't want anyone knowing. <laughs> you were coming up. Um, uh, but I think someone has been answered. But I'll ask him. What I'll do is we'll go through these. Okay, it's not, yeah, there's not loads of them. Perfect. And then after that, we can cover anything that we haven't covered that you may want to cover. Okay, so uh, this is from Derry Knox. Uh, ask him how he feels about the way not only his situation was handled, but also other Brits that needed assistance and weren't given it. And also, what are your plans now? I think we've all answered that partly, but you can, you can go for it if you want. Yeah, no, I think is that, you know, for me, personally, I, I made the stand that I was staying until my staff were out. So, um, however, I never got a call forward until literally the day before I actually tried to get to the airfield. So, um, you know, I knew what I would get into that airfield, whatever it took, if I really needed to. Um, you know, I, I had plans in the back of my mind how I was going to do that. Um, but, you know, there are, like I said, there are Brits who are still there. That British bus driver, he never got a call forward. He couldn't get into the airfield. He's there with his you know, wife and kids now, stuck, you know, as behind enemy lines is such to say. Um, you know, and he's got no no out unless he now tries to go cross country. He doesn't have any Afghan ID. He only has a British passport. So we've just got to hope that Britain does maintain relations with the Taliban. Otherwise, you know, literally he is, you know, a, a walking hostage, isn't he? So, you know, for these people, yeah, that's absolutely terrifying. So, no, I'd say... I'm not happy with how you know, Britain treated the, the British subjects that they still have there. Oh, and what's your plans now as the second part of the question? So for me, obviously, we're still going. We're nonstop trying to get our staff out. You know, obviously, back now with my wife, but we haven't had a you know, celebration or a party or anything. Um, you know, it, it, she's full on trying to get her girls out of Afghanistan or get them from refugee camps into friendly countries. And obviously we're full on with our plans to get the staff out. So the the time we have a proper party will be once I know they're on an airplane and they're heading to the UK, then I will finally be, you know, jumping up and down. And I think there'll probably be a, a few bottles cracked. Yeah, understandable. Um, from Dave Davis, is there a fourth book in the pipeline? And if so, what's it going to be called? <laughs> um, we, we actually were for the charity, obviously going forward before this Taliban, uh, we were thinking about a fourth book just to bring everybody up to speed, but we really didn't know what the subject was going to be. Um, I think we have the subject now, that's for sure. Um, so if anything, it'd probably be called Operation Arc. Okay. Another one from Dave. Uh, it, with the Nozai charity, is it going to be able to, is it going to be able to continue with a revised aim or in some other way, some other form or not? Yeah, that's that's a, a very good question and that's something we've been talking about you know and, but not in any serious terms at the moment because like i said the focus is on the staff but um yeah we we don't operate in afghanistan anymore for now so we're going to have to come up with a new direction um so we've got a few ideas obviously yeah we, we've got the support i mean the support we've had has always been amazing but now it's even more amazing um so we've got funding coming in that's why we're still asking for donations um, to help with the evacuation of the staff, to help with the resettlement of the staff in England, and then to help, obviously, now is adding whatever new direction it goes in. Um, so we're going to, we've just given ourselves, we said to like the end of September, you know, to bat some ideas around, and then hopefully we can announce 
you know, a kind of direction that we want to be going in. But obviously we have to go through the Charity Commission to change our mission objectives. You know, we can't just set up in a new country. So we've got to go through them first to get clearance to do whatever we think we're going to do. Yeah, you never know. Fingers crossed. Hopefully an opportunity might still present itself in Afghanistan, which would be ideal, right? Obviously. But the, like you were saying just now, the focus is on the staff right now. Get the staff um, out and then we can look at that, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so last one. So it's, it's a similar question from Alan Rankin and Scott Forbes. Um, what uh, What's the situation uh, with the animals' futures in the UK? Have you managed to find homes for them all yet? Um, so a lot of the dogs and cats I brought back, we actually got 94 dogs out and uh, 79 cats. But sadly, we've now lost, like I said, six of the cats due to the tear gas. Um, so a lot of those actually had homes already because some of them were expats who worked in Afghanistan, who got evacuated and obviously couldn't take their animals with them. So they came to Nauzad. Um, you know, and they said, look, if you get a chance, please get my dog or cat out. Um, some of them were part of our rehoming scheme anyway. They already had scheduled flights out of Afghanistan, but obviously they all got cancelled. So they were already going to homes. Uh, I've got one American soldier rescue in there, a dog called Flower. Um, we've got to get Flower to the US now. But that's a whole new story because at the moment there's a centre for disease control ban on dogs from Afghanistan entering the US anyway. So we've got to work around that. Um, I've got my own uh, dogs, my, my wife and my dogs, they were on that shipment. Um, and the rest, then we've got probably about, I think it's like 30% of them we need to find homes for. Um, so we're at the moment, we're asking people just to hold off messages about adoptions, let the dust settle, let the animals settle into the UK, finish their um, death row quarantine procedures, etc. And then we'll look at obviously the getting them rehomed. Um, so that's how that's working with all of them. Okay. Is there anything that we've not covered that you want to cover, Ben? Um, no, I, ju I just really, truly want to thank everybody who supported us. Um, like I said, the love and compassion that's been shown has just been mind-blowing. Um, I never, ever expected this. Um, you know, and, and so I really do want to thank everybody from the bottom of my heart because they're the ones who made the difference. They funded our you know, our flight into Afghanistan to get the people and the dogs and cats out. Sadly, obviously, due to, you know, circumstances that couldn't be controlled, we couldn't get the people on that flight. Um, but, you know, and they're there now support me and I don't listen to all the rubbish that's put in the press. I only listen to all the fabulous positive messages I've received. I actually had three days into this, which kind of clogged up the system a little bit, but I've had over 35,000 emails <laughs> Um, so we're still trying to work through all that. So if anybody has listened to this, you did email me, I will respond to you. It just might not be today, tomorrow or next week because, you know, we've got a team now working just on answering my emails, um, you know, just so we can actually find stuff that we need to answer to immediately and stuff that we can wait a little bit. On. But yeah, the, I just want to thank everybody. You know, they, they made this happen. I just happened to be the one there. But it's everybody else, you know, in the background and behind the scenes who made this possible. Yeah, absolutely right. Which shout out. And I know um well, yeah, you mentioned Tony, Tony Liz as well. I know um uh Mike Valant as well, Rugby for Heroes. Um they were I think they made donations actually. Hey Shower, yep. yeah, I'll make a I'll make a donation as well, mate. And on, on that note, so how can listeners and viewers help you at the moment? Um is there any right way? now? Right now, please, yeah, I mean, we're still taking donations. Like I said, the, the money is towards getting our staff out of Afghanistan, helping with their resettlement when they do come out of Afghanistan. We don't want, you know, the Nauzad staff to be a burden on the taxpayer. So, you know, if people, you know, can afford to donate, then we're asking them to donate and then we won't be, you know, we're not going to be a burden. Um, we've had job offers, offers of training, etc. So we want to be there to help them, you know, with the other bits, you know, so looking after them with housing, making sure there's people on call that can help them with any problems so they don't clog up, you know, the, the immigration system here in the UK. But then also helping us, you know, fund basically then a new direction for Nauzad. So we've got the funds in place. If we do decide to start somewhere else, well, not if we do, we will. But where are we going to do that? You know, and we've got the funds already to be able to go straight into action. 
um, you know, sadly, there are animals all over the world that need support and help. Um, you know, and we've got a, a great team who actually you know, have been able to do that in Afghanistan. So if we can take what we've learned from Afghanistan, you know, we should be able to do that anywhere, really, to be fair. Hmm. OK, well, well done to you, your wife, you know, the staff as well, mate. And um, and good luck for the future. And if anything I can do to assist, just, well, you got my number now. <laughs> Don't send me 35,000 <laughs> emails, though. Um, no, yeah, once I get through that. But, yeah, no, I appreciate you having us on today. Thank you. Um, you know, it's, it's nice as well just to be able to, you know, say a few things out loud, you know, and, and let people know, you know, what is actually happening out there and what did happen out there yeah mate. and this is why this is why you know i wanted to do this and i'm glad you said yes because you're dealing with a lot of misinformation you know you 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 were at the brunt of it a lot of misinformation a lot of misunderstanding partly because the people's ignorance of what what gone on partly because of uh the way events have been portrayed and and mistruths have been given for whatever reason and so uh this serves i think as this is it. This is this is this is the this is the gen, as they say. You know the ground truth, and so uh, I hope it helps, mate. What's the website? Charity website. So our website is www.nowzad.nowzad.com. Perfect. I'll see you when you get to the UK, and I'll buy you a beer. All right, I'll hold you to that, mate. Thank you very much. <laughs> Cheers, mate. <laughs> All right. Cheers, buddy. Take care. That's it. Thank you for watching the H Hour podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast and you haven't already done so, please subscribe here around about there. I'm hoping it's around about there where the button's going to appear. If not, if it's not already appeared, uh, you can also, um, if you want to listen to the podcast on your commute, for example, when you're driving, when it's not practical to watch the podcast, you can listen to it. It's on Spotify. It's on Apple Podcasts. It's on Google Podcasts. It's everywhere. It's on all of the uh, all of the common and not so common podcast apps. You can also, if you wish to do it, become a patron of Hey Chower. Becoming a patron of Hey Chower, you get access to all of the interviews before anyone else. So this interview with this guest was released days, if not weeks, before it was on release to the general public. And you also get access to uh, exclusive interviews, which I do with each guest, that last about 5-10 minutes, that are based on questions that the patrons themselves of Hey Chower have chosen. And each guest, this one included, gets asked those questions before the main podcast that's getting recorded. It's like a pre-podcast interview, lasts about 10 minutes. And those interviews are really insightful, really enjoyable, nice and short, and they're only released to patrons. They never, they never get released to the public. I don't know why I had a little stutter there. Um, you also get access to... A Discord community, exclusive Discord community only for patrons. You also get invited to a monthly Zoom call with myself and all the other patrons. And very often, most months, we have a previous podcast guest comes onto that Zoom call and has an exclusive Q&A with the patrons. In addition to this, there's monthly giveaways. We give away, give away gifts to my patron supporters. And it's all like, well, predominantly veteran-owned stuff. I'll go and buy veteran-owned apparel, veteran-owned product services, and I'll give them away to my patron supporters. And I'll also uh, do exclusive invites for events. So you'll get freebie tickets to events. To become a patron of Page Hour, go to patreon.com forward slash HK podcast. I'm spelling Patreon, P A T R E O N. Patreon.com forward slash HK podcasts. Hit become a patron. And uh, I'll see you on the next Zoom, Q Zoom QA if you do. Oh, you also get your name in the credits. Thanks for watching. I will catch you next time.